Good morning. That always scares me for some reason <laughs> when you guys do that. Um, I'm Jill Thomas. I'm chair of the worship committee, and I'll be your worship leader today along with Mike John Garius. And we're very pleased to have a guest speaker this morning, and you'll hear more about him later. Uh, we are pleased that you're joining us either in person or online, and know that all are welcome here. All ethnicities and races, all sexual orientation and gender identities, all social and economic situations, all abilities. We have several accommodations to enhance your experience. There's a scent-free area, large print hymnals, hearing assist devices. For our littlest friends, we have some busy bags and some rug uh, space for them to crawl on. If you listen when you, your hands are busy, we have fidgets for the littlest to the biggest. Uh, after the service, we'll have coffee and tea and treats, and most importantly, conversation. We'll be in the fellowship hall. There's even a Zoom version for those who can't make it. If you're a newcomer, it can be an act of courage to seek out new connections in that setting. Please know we really want to get to know you better. To help ease you into coffee hour, there is a newcomer's table just inside the doors, and I encourage you to seek it out. I can assure you that you will be very welcomed. Please consider giving the church a gift of your time and energy. Volunteers are needed every Sunday to help set up coffee hour, and today we really need some extra help with cleanup. You can always bring donations of snacks, and altar decorations will be, the altar will be bare next week if somebody doesn't step up. Not only will you be providing a service to the church, but it's a wonderful opportunity to get to know each other. Another opportunity is an open invitation to mugs and musings. Our membership coordinator, Regina Stanley, invites you to join her on uh -huh. Thursday mornings at a local coffee shop for a mug of coffee or your favorite hot beverage. It's an opportunity to join in conversation of whatever's on your mind, whether it's spirituality, current events, personal stories, any subject that's interesting and important to you. Each month it will be held at a different coffee shop. For the month of February, meetings will be at 10 a.m. on Thursdays at the Intuition Coffee on Main Street. Our church is a unique church. <laughs> we are. <laughs> Our members and our friends are not asked to subscribe to a belief or a specific deity or a specific the theology. Rather, we live to live out our mission, embracing freedom, loving inclusively, growing spiritually, and healing our world. Our campus sits on 15 acres of wood, which we share with deer and foxes, all kinds of birds and other wildlife. We recognize that we are just the current taker, caretaker of this land. This was the ancestral home of the Peoria people long before the first European came down the river. They and other nations we honor. We honor them for what they are today and who they were in the past. Now is the time to think about putting your cell phone into worship mode. If you set it to vibrate, there's some, there's a cheat sheet for you. <laughs> and if you can't follow the cheat sheet, maybe you can ask one of your neighbors. As we enter into our worship together, please rise in body or spirit and join us in our opening hymn, Gather the Spirit. Kathy will play it through once and then we will all join in.
universalist draws from many sources. Just one of these is words and deeds of prophetic people which challenge us to confront powers and structures of evil justice, compassion, and the transforming power of love. Our opening words are from a very unusual source today, and Mike will share them with us. Well, good morning. Um, <clears throat> as mentioned, Bob Fuller's giving a talk today entitled Thoughts on Spirituality Today. So that prompted a question in my mind, what do we mean by this whole term called spirit? And I'm just not asking the young people here. There's lots of adults, myself included, who struggle with defining what that term is or describing what it is. I mean, you know, you can't, you can't see it, you can't touch it, but you can feel it, right? Some people say it's right here. Or is it out there, among the trees, the sky, the stars, or beyond? Or is it a connection between the two that makes it a special experience? Well, uh, Sandy taught uh, fourth grade um, a few years ago, and she shared this response that a fourth grade student had written to a question or a topic about kindness. So I'm going to share that with you today as our reading, because I think she gets it. And I'll read it. What does kindness mean to you? Kindness to me means that you are kind to someone because you are a good person, not because you want attention. That isn't kindness. If you say hi to someone or not bully them when other people are, that isn't being kind. I lost my place. That's being nice. Being kind is getting to know that person instead of just saying hi. Being kind is standing up for that person instead of just not bullying them. Everyone can be kind, but you have to want to be kind. Everyone can do it. Thank you. I'd like to invite our family up to light the chalice, this dish. Okay, well, my helper is going to hide behind me, so I'll do it. <laughs> this is something we're all familiar with, and we do it a lot back in RE. We are Unitarian Universalists. This is the Church of the Open Mind. This is the Church of the Helping Hands. This is the Church of the Loving Hearts. Together we care for our earth and work for peace in our world. Thank you. <laughs> That was the Smizrood family. Uh, every Sunday we practice a ritual that we call candles of care. And we know that if we have a single candle in a dark room, it doesn't shed much light. But a multitude of candles can chase away the dark corners. Our hearts and our minds bear many joys and concerns. While Kathy plays music for meditation, a single candle will be lit on each table. You are then invited to light a candle of your own. You can light a candle for a joy, a sorrow, a hope, a remembrance, a concern, whatever is on your heart. When the ritual is complete, the candles will be shining brightly, just as many candles light a room, and our can many candles shining brightly show our shared concern and love for one another. It, it, we hope it helps to light your path. Kathy? Thank you. 
We send our sympathies out to the family and the friends of Glenn Zip. Glenn was quite a character, and he was a member of this church for a long, long time. Uh, Mary Mulholland Kafar is with us today, and she's thankful for all the love and support that have been shown to her. Her wife died not too long ago. Um, from the uh, family of Owen, we have gratitude and appreciation from BJ, Terrence, Ross, and Emily Lindsay for all the love and kindness they have received from their UU family. Since Owen's death in February of 2023, we honor Owen as we mark this anniversary, and he loved this congregation so very much. We also sent healing wishes out to Nancy Benson. Nancy broke her hip and is in a Lutheran home and would appreciate cards. Um, from the wider world, we offer condolences and solidarity to the family and friends of Nex. Uh, Nex Benedict of Asawaso, Oklahoma. Nex Fix was 16 years old, non-binary, and he died February 8th after reportedly being beaten up by three older students in the girls' bathroom. Nexus Mother is a, a registered member of the Choctaw Nation, and Asawa is part of the Choctaw Reservation. Next was beautiful and beloved. May their family know justice and peace. As always, there are joys and sorrows that are in our hearts but remain unspoken. Please join me for a moment of silent meditation.
Now I'd like to invite our Director of Lifetime Religious Education to give us the story for all ages. Have you ever wondered why some people have so many different names for what they might call God, or the spirit of life, or the mystery? My story today is God Has Many Names by Mary Ann Moore. And once upon a time, two children were playing with each other Sometimes they argued about who could swing the highest, whose cookie was biggest. But one time, though, they were arguing about God's real name. One said, God's real name is the mother of us all. And the other said, no, it isn't. God's real name is Father in heaven. No, it's Mother. No. Father, I have an idea, said the first kiddo. Let's go and find God and ask her what her name is. Then we'll know for sure that I'm right. Okay, the second kiddo agreed. Thought that was a good idea because then when they found God, they knew that he could tell them that his name was Father. So the children set off to find God, even though both of them were a bit afraid to go that far from home. And they might be afraid to speak with God. Well, after they had gone some distance, they met people carrying some food home from the market. And they asked, we're going to look for God so that we can find out what their name is. And one of the people said, well, I think if you go straight down this road here, you'll find God. But there's no need. I can tell you that their real name is the giver of life. The children thanked the people, but said, I still want to ask God what they call themselves. And the people offered some bread and fruit to the children, and they carried on their way. Next, they came to a river where people were fishing from a boat. And the children asked where they could find God so they could find God's real name. And the people told them, well, you will have to cross the river, but there's no need. We can tell you God's real name. It is Hidden One. But if you still want to go on, we'll give you a ride to the other side. So the children continued on, and they began to get a little tired. <sighs> and they found the next group of people in the forest and asked them, what is God's real name? And those people said, God's real name is Protector. And the children thought and decided that they still wanted to continue on their journey and see if they could find out for themselves. So the people gave the children some blankets so they could stay warm at night. And when night came, the children ate the bread and fruit and were nourished, and they had the blankets to be protected. And as they slept soundly in the trees, they heard a kindly voice say to them, I understand. There are some children who want to know my real name. <gasps> That's right, we do, the children cried together. Well, what do you think it is? And the first child said, I think it's mother of all. And God said, and so it is. And the second child said, well, I thought it was father in heaven. And so it is. God said, oh, wait a minute, the children said. How can we both be right? 
And what about those people who think your name is giver of life and hidden one and protector? Oh, they're right too. But how can you have more than one name? Doesn't one of them have to be the right name? No, said God. I have many names. Some say I have 99. Some say I have thousands. What are some of those names? Mother of all, Father in heaven, Shiva, the great spirit, Gaia, the truth, the creator, Allah. Any of these names is my real name if the person using it says it with a loving heart. Ah, said the children, and they thank God for helping them to understand. And as they made their way back home, the children argued about who was the fastest and who was the bravest, but they didn't argue anymore about God's real name. I wonder what names you use to describe that great mystery. The children are invited to join me for religious education back in the RE wing. Just as a single candle cannot light a room, a single donation does not light the sanctuary. Just as we shared our candle light, just as our shared candle lights convey our love and concern for one another, our combined financial contribution does so as well. When we contribute, whether it is of time, ideas, energy, help, or especially at coffee hour, or money, we are saying, this church is important to me. This church is an important part of the community. It is an act of commitment and dedication, and at times it can be an act of courage to support our progressive religious tradition. We live out our values with our offering with a practice called Share the Plate. One third of the de undesignated funds on the, in the collection plate will go to an agency that shares our UU values. The other two thirds supports the church and pays the light bill. This month, our Share the Plate recipient is the Picket Fence Foundation. This foundation provides employment and training opportunities for adults with disabilities. It sets an example of hiring the disability for other businesses in Chillicothe. Their operation consists of a gift shop, floral studio, garden center, and greenhouse. Their gift shop is home to the Ability Marketplace, featuring beautiful products made by children and adults with disabilities from all around the world. This variety allows them to provide many different job experiences for people with disabilities, focusing on young adults especially that are trans trans transitioning from school to the community. As spring is around the corner, consider shopping there for your garden needs. They're on 4th Street in Chillicothe. You can use an envelope in the pews, uh, or you can uh, just lay some cash in the, the plate. We always take cash. Or there's a QR code on the order of service. Would the ushers please come forward?
This is a, uh, this is a reading by C.T. Vivian. It was excerpted from an interview he did with Taylor Branch in 2011. And many of you are familiar with C.T. Vivian. He was an early civil rights activist. He has roots in central Illinois. I think he went to school in Macomb before he resettled in Peoria. And he led a, um, a demonstration to desegregate a cafeteria here in Peoria in 1947. He later became a close advisor to Martin Luther King. And uh, he passed away in 2020 at the age of 95. Um, and as many of you probably already know that uh, a couple of years ago, there was a grade school renamed in his honor, C.T. Vivian uh, Grade School in Peoria. So this is a reflection on uh, the importance of education that he, he mentioned in this interview in 2011. When you rise to greatness, only one thing sticks out to me, that I want to keep on fighting this struggle until I'm no longer here. The movement goes on. I'm trying to put together an organization, and I'll give you an idea of why I'm doing it. I want to see that we create up to a million black people a year that pass the ACT test at a high level. We've got the method to do it right now. We just sent a girl to Princeton. She got a 32. That's Harvard level. The point is, given the global world in which we live, what we have known as good is not good enough. I've come to the conclusion that following freedom, always, it has to have education. Education must always follow freedom. Whatever degree of freedom you gain, it has to be followed with a greater degree of education. Thank you. Will you now stand as you are willing and able and join us in singing the hymn, Not in Vain, Not in Vain the Distance Beckons. Well, I am pleased and happy to welcome Dr. Robert Fuller and Kathy Fuller to our church, back to our church, I should say. It's been a few years. Um, Bob Fuller's known to many of us, um, I think spanning, I don't know, Bob, 20, 30 years that you've... I first spoke here over 40 years ago. Okay, I'm sorry. 
40 years of tradition uh, where Bob's presented talks to our congregation. Bob was a professor of religion, or still is a professor of religious studies at Bradley University, uh, where he had uh, done his academic work for 43 years. Uh, he's during that time, he received many teaching excellence awards. Um, he retired about three years ago. Uh, retired, yes, but always a teacher. So I am honored to uh, introduce Dr. Fuller to speak to us today. Uh, his discussion is entitled Thoughts on Spirituality Today. Bob, you want to come on up? There we go. <laughs> good to see you. Hey, Mike. Thank you. <laughs> oh, it, it is good to be here. It, it was over 40 years ago that I first spoke to Peoria's UU uh, congregation. Um, downtown, of course, uh, right by the hospital uh, in the building. And this is one of the uh, communities that I usually if I speak to a religious congregation of any kind, any church, um, I am way to the left of, of the group and um, usually am considered um, way too humanistic and secular and grading. This is the one congregation that occasionally I um, get into conversation with afterwards, and I'm said I was far too uh, to the right or too religious <laughs> or, or spiritual. So uh, we're going to play with that today. This isn't a sermon. This is a talk to explore. And um, as I do so, I, I do want to shout out watching us uh, over the, I guess, Zoom or Facebook this morning are two former members of this congregation. Some of you would know Ann Growey and Rick Growey. Uh, they now live in uh, Golden, Colorado. Uh, we will be with them two weeks from today. Um, we see them quite a bit out there, but they are watching, and so we can welcome them into our group to, um, this morning, too. But um, here is what uh, prompted my thoughts for today and what I want to share with you. Um, and I want you to be thinking about this. Um, we have been very fortunate in the United States. We have polling organizations that for decades and decades and decades have surveyed Americans to find out, you know, what's going on and including not just our political views or about social issues, but about religion. And Gallup poll did this for years and they would ask people, do you believe in a God? Is this belief important to you or not very important? And do you attend services? But in more recent years, it's been a group called the Pew Research Center. And the Pew Research Center gives us our best possible surveying of our fellow Americans about topics of religion and spirituality. And this last fall, they had been realizing for a long time that church attendance is gradually going lower in the United States, at least compared to um, the 1950s um, weekly church attendance. The number of Americans who say that biblical-centered concepts of God are important to them is declining a bit, but they knew that this didn't mean that just because people weren't as church-centered that they were perhaps less spiritual in some other sense. And they released their most um, comprehensive um, survey of spirituality in America, and this came out late in the fall, and it's my thoughts about this. I used to say to students, um, imagine you are coming to Bradley University in the fall, and you get a letter from you, the person who is going to be your roommate, and the first sentence says, I think you should know I'm a very religious person. And then you spill your can of soda pop all over the letter, and you can't read anymore, and that's all you know is what they said in that first sentence. What are your thoughts? Are you looking forward to being the roommate of this person? Are, are you dreading having this person be your roommate? What um, assumptions do you have about their, their life in and out of um, the classroom, et cetera? And will they be a good roommate to have? Well, maybe we could ask this. You know, the words religion and spiritual are really the same words. And if you look at what they mean, they mean some, and I'll play with this a little more, <laughs> belief in something more than what we can 
objectively measure with our five physical senses some sense of recognition of and wanting to align our lives with something more than natural, more than physical, if you will, supernatural, metaphysical. In recent years, we have somewhat arbitrarily divided the words religion and spirituality a little bit. Again, they really mean the same thing and can be used interchangeably. But we've tended to use the word religiousness for people whose inclinations towards this more than physical is centered around and connected with a church tradition. The scriptures of that tradition, um, the practices and rituals and conceptions of deity of that tradition. And we've tended to use the word spiritual for really the same thing, excepting people who don't feel bound by a single tradition and don't, um, aren't as channeled by a specific scripture or community's um, historic um, way of understanding those. So anyway, the Pew Research Center wanted to go about asking Americans about their spirituality, whether or not it was connected to church um, belief and practice uh, or not. And I think that this provides all of us here a thought. Because if you got that same letter or someone said to you, I consider myself a very spiritual person, what are you assuming about them? <laughs> what kinds of preconceptions? And is this really a good thing or a not thing? And we know very much that the UU tradition is, has a certain bit of going back and forth and a little bit of complexity. And in any congregation, there's going to be quite a diversity of, of thoughts about how good it is to um, be um, a spiritual person and what all might be meant by that. Well, let's start with what the Pew Research Center told us. And first of all, their nationwide survey told us that 70% of Americans consider spirituality to be an important part of their identity. 70%. We live in a day and age of think of how electronic computers, uh, electrical engineering has um, defined the way we gather information um, and process it. How much we live in a world where we have mapped the human genome through scientific investigation. We are so, um, science and technology so permeate our life, and yet 70% of Americans tell the Pew Research Center that spirituality is important um, to them. Now, many of these people do attend, of course, religious organizations, but uh, many don't. And yet still, now, what did Pew Research Center ask these people? <laughs> what did they respond so that this word spirituality could be measured and, and we know? Well, mostly they asked them if they had certain beliefs about the more than natural, the metaphysical, the supernatural. So for example, 81% of adults told the Pew Research Center that they believe that humans possess a soul or a spirit over and beyond their physical bodies. Even this will become something of, um, all of us would probably want to parse this out and, and what all specifically do we mean by that? We've all heard people say, for example, that we're interested in people's mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual health or well-being. But what, when we threw the word spiritual in there, did we really mean anything that couldn't have been covered by mental and emotional? What all might it mean? I often had to tell my students when we would get in discussions, particularly in a class in the psychology department on the psychology of religion, when using the word soul, I would have to point out, if you go to any of the anatomy books, used in pre-med classes in any biology in any university in the United States, the, and you go to the index of those anatomy um, books, you will not find the word spirit or soul in the index to a human physiology and anatomy. So what do you mean when you use these words? Well, I don't have the answers, but this is what this community here does think about. Do we believe that humans have a soul or a spirit over and beyond the physical body, 81% of Americans do. 
That same percentage is how many believe there is something more to the world than our sciences can tell us, something more to the universe than what can be um, studied by the natural sciences. 71% believe in an afterlife heaven. And most, but not all, of those people who believe in heaven but believe that in this afterlife we will be reunited with loved ones. Does spirituality have to do with belief in an afterlife heaven or being reunited uh, with loved ones in, in the afterlife? Um, by the way, about a third of Americans believe they have had um, spirits of departed human beings communicating with them attempting to send messages to them. Um, they feel they've had some kind of experience of encountering um, an unseen spirit. Is this about spirituality? Because the Pew Research Center asked these kinds of questions to find out if people uh, were spiritual. And by the way, about a half of Americans, half of us in this country, believe that spirits um, reside in frequent places like cemeteries or that there are specific places in nature where you're more likely to encounter spiritual presences, spiritual energies. Um, it's interesting. Now, they also tried to look at practices. They asked um, Americans if in the last month you've had at least twice these kinds of experiences. One was, for example, about half of Americans have said in the last month they have had experiences of wonder and awe that were emotionally intense and made them think beyond the physical universe to something supernatural, metaphysical, so something that um, is more ultimate um, and final than all of the powers of, of nature. They get triggered into a, a momentary sense of, of the existence of something more, something metaphysical. Um, Again, we already know that about um, a third of, of Americans um, have these experiences of deceased individuals trying to communicate, send message, make contact with them. Now, they also ask people, um, do you meditate? And I, I sometimes find these numbers a little high. I, I, I don't really know that I think of this, but not only did they find that many people took time to meditate, but about one in five Americans say they meditate for specifically spiritual reasons, um, not just for psychological composure or to feel um, inwardly calm and centered, and, um, but they did this to connect with something more than physical, um, something distinctively spiritual. Um, walking in nature. Now, a lot of people walk, who spend time um, in nature, ha more than half of the people said they did it for enjoyment or because it just gave them physical vigor um, and energy. But um, about a third of people said that this was a time where they felt connected with what is more than natural, metaphysical. So, Absorbed, being absorbed into nature became a spiritual activity more so than just a recreational activity. And of course, people um, who would practice yoga, um, a small percentage of Americans who practice yoga uh, do so for specifically spiritual reasons, not just physical and mental and emotional composure, um, so that we um, have all this. But I should also add Increasingly, Americans will also own a piece of jewelry. For example, it could be a cross that they wear, um, a, a Catholic saint, um, something that brings them that, um, a sense of spirituality just by holding it. And even tattoos can have spiritual significance. You could have a Bible verse or um, some icon of, of world religion tattooed onto you so, to remind you constantly of something more than physical. Um, a distinctively spiritual significance to it. Well, with all of this spirituality, first of all, it's remarkable. In an otherwise such secular, scientific, technological world, we have our fellow Americans very interested in specifically spiritual interests and have very specifically spiritual beliefs and ideas. Um, it's something to take cognizance of. It's the second thing for me, what are my thoughts about it? Um, what do I actually think and believe about it? And I want to do a little of this reflection for a minute or two in the UU tradition. 
I'm no expert, I'm no historian of the universalist uh, tradition in America or the Unitarian, but when I was in graduate school, I wrote my dissertation on a very interesting form of psychology of the day. In the late 1700s and early 1800s, there was a Dr. Mesmer, and Mesmer would put people into a hypnotic trance, and they call that mesmerizing people. And to this day, you'll hear, I was mesmerized by some person or some event. They would go into a hypnotic trance, and it would be deep hypnosis, and they would feel calm and restful. And when they would wake back up out of this trance, they would feel invigorated, often cured of minor ailments and illnesses, but some of the people in these trances claim to have extrasensory perception, telepathy, clairvoyance, being able to even influence events at a distance with just their thoughts. And still others, a few, claim to be in a state where they could communicate directly with the spirit world and bring messages so that modern spiritualism in the United States came out of this mesmerizing people. Um, Christian science, Mary Baker Eddy was healed by a mesmerist and this gave her her power of the mind to bring physical healing um, and all of this. And so, um, I, so I was studying all of this and what, how did people respond? And I read several pamphlets and tracts by Unitarian ministers. And all of the tracts responding to this spirituality and belief in the supernatural back in the 1800s that I read by Unitarians, universally, the Unitarian ministers thought that this was a um, superstitious fad and that people were getting carried away in flights of fantasy and letting little anecdotal moments spur their imagination, and it was mostly delusional thinking. And they called for people to be more critical and analytic of all of the claims that were coming out of these people who were mesmerized and having these supernatural or, or spiritual experiences. But remember, at this time, the Universalist and Unitarians were not merged. The Universalist ministers who published pamphlets and small books on the mesmerism uh, fad of the day, they tended to be more welcoming of it. They tended to embrace it and be much more um, experimental and experientially interested in, we should be looking for this. How might we put ourselves to put away our daily thinking and cleanse the doors of perception to make ourselves receptive to higher realities? And the universalist ministers that I read anyway tended to be much more interested in the contemporary fad of their day. I was in my early and mid-20s and really couldn't make sense of this one way or the other and um, didn't know for sure what I thought of the spiritual enthusiasms of the 1800s uh, spurred on by this mesmerism phenomenon. I still don't fully know. And I was very interested in going to the web before today and the thoughts, and I just pulled this off of the web, I actually cut and paste, from the, the website for the Peoria UU Church. If you look at the seven principles that um, guide the community and the congregation here at the Peoria UU, nothing in the seven principles is specifically metaphysical or supernatural. It has to do with ethical compassion, and a concern for human well-being and natural well-being throughout the world. But when you look at the sources of thought and the sources of faith, the very first one says direct experiences of that transcending mystery affirmed in all cultures, which moves us to a renewal of the spirit and an openness to the forces which create and uphold life. And then if you go three down, the very next one says, we should be guided by humanist teachings which counsel us to heed the guidance of reason and the results of science and warn us against the idolatries of the mind. So here we are. How do we make sense? And I'd like to kind of uh, begin to put some focus now finally on thoughts on spirituality by saying, um, 
I've come to uh, these, I think, final views. And the, the first of the three is, is that spiritual experiences, people who feel they've connected with a higher reality, people who feel they have connected with something supernatural and more than physical, are obviously going to be important and authoritative to those people who have those experiences. And they should be. We should be guided by our experience. I would like to step back and caution all people who have had these to be aware what I've become increasingly aware throughout my life about my experiences like this. That I'm capable of self-delusion. I'm capable of very quickly coming to a, um, a thought about something that's triggered we'll say, a supernatural um, a, a thought that doesn't hold up under more analysis that we need to bring some hard, sober reason. Uh, is the, can this be verified? Can, is it um, just the things that science asks for verification and replication? And to bring an analysis. But nonetheless, for those who honestly believe they have had these kinds of in-depth spirit experiences of something more than physical, metaphysical, I think they not only do have authority in the lives of those individuals, but they should have authority in the lives of the individuals. But my second reflection is this, that no matter how convincing those experiences are in the inner lives of others, I am not bound to um, completely capitulate to that. I am not bound to accept uncritically the experiences of other people. I still have the right and um, must be a lamp unto myself, as the Buddha would have put it, to be a critical um, analysis of the experience. And so I don't need to blindly follow others just because of the convincingness of their inward experiences. But when we find that 50, 70, all those numbers I threw out earlier of Americans who have vivid spiritual beliefs, experiences, it reminds us how important spirituality is to the lives of our fellow Americans and to ourselves. And I think that in the UU tradition, it's important maybe to ask this question, and especially maybe as we guide young people towards it. You know, I taught Bradley college students for 43 years, Cullen being one of them <laughs> in the back here. Um, and uh, what world are you here in college to adapt to? Living beings adapt to their surroundings or they don't survive. And of course, when I was around 20, 18 to 22 year olds, they were trying to adapt first and foremost to America's business environment, the economic environment. What skills are needed out there and how do I acquire these so I can adapt to the economic world? But they also wanted to, of course, adapt to the social world. Very important that they be um, well adapted to their fellow college students and be part of the social groupings. But it strikes me in human life and that the UU tradition is spiritual in the sense that it also says there is something more to the universe. We all wake up in the morning and open our eyes and we find ourselves alive and awake in a world we did not create. We find ourselves, again, opening our eyes to a universe that finite creatures did not create. Existence to us living beings is a gift in that sense. It is sacred to us because it was beyond our creation. There's a mystery to what that all might mean, to how a universe came to be, and we open our eyes to find ourselves in it. But that sense that life is sacred, it fills us with gratitude. And gratitude right there is, is the humbling moment that opens ourselves to the mystery of life, to the preciousness of life, and perhaps opens us to appreciate the inner lives of beings other than ourselves. One of the hardest things as humans is to recognize and to have any empathy for the inner lives of 
other beings. And I think that that sense of the mystery and the gift of life is the beginning of that moment. And it gives us a freshness. It's a universe we didn't create. It stimulates our curiosity and reaching out and, and venturing. Um, so that as I think about the UU church and the place in things is that it is a community. Even for those of us in this community who might first and foremost think of social justice, the integrity of the natural environment as issues that bring this community and center the concerns, yes, but justice and peace really aren't out there in the world. <laughs> Life is not just, biologically. <laughs> um, peace does not happen, really. These are something that we somehow come to believe should exist in the universe. That in the world's highest expression, it exists. So again, there's not just adapting to the political and the economic and the social environments. There is a, if you will, higher environment that human beings should seek out and try in some way. So that a UU church, I think, is here to open up for all of us some spiritual concerns and to keep that a part of our lives, of the, that mystery and the sense of gratitude and wonder, and it's humbling, and to help guide us towards what I consider, what I call, what is the best existential response to this more, this metaphysical, this higher reality, highest environment we could adapt ourselves to, and what is the ethical response? Now, by existential, I mean our experience. How do we open ourselves? And here, I think that from the people who gather, for example, is it every Sunday a group gathers for the Course in Miracles? Showing that in, in this congregation, there is always a core of people. How do I inwardly find my, rearrange my expectations and understanding of the life so that I'm open and receptive to the sublime, to something more, to how did this... Um, page from the Unitarian Church to one of the things that guides us is our sense of opening ourselves up to the freshening uh, creative energies of, of life. So part of it's an existential response to this wider environment, opening ourselves up, seeking it out. And the second is, of course, the ethical. What are my behaviors? What behaviors? And to decenter our own egotism, to understand that this universe that we opened our eyes this morning and found ourselves alive in, um, our own individuality is less significant in this. And we have to think for the wider web of life. We have to think for the wider span of time and of generations and to be open again to the inner lives of individuals who are otherwise very different than us. Well. <laughs> the Pew Research Center has told us that spirituality is actually quite alive and well uh, in this world. And I think that the UU tradition is pretty um, plugged into the nuances and shares, I think, some critical um, not embracing every aspect of the spirituality we find in America today, but very appreciative of it overall for its bringing us the right existential and, and ethical responses to our, our ongoing sense that life is a gift. <laughs> and it is, in that sense, very sacred. But with that, I've shared with you my little thoughts on, on contemporary spirituality, and I know I've gone just past uh, 1130. So I want to thank you for having me here, uh, again, of more than four decades of, of being invited into this congregation. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Fuller. Uh, now, if you would stand as you're willing and able, we'll sing our closing hymn, We Are Building a New Way.
An Unquenchable Flame by Ben Atherton Zeman. As we extinguish the flame on our chalice, we ignite it inside ourselves. Our commitment to our mission and to one another is an unquenchable flame. Let us remember that we are not alone until we light this flame next time. I'll leave you with Sharing Our Blessings by Adam Slate. We end our gathering with gratitude for the camaraderie, the shared wisdom, the goodwill, and the support that we extend to each other in this community. May we continue to bless each other with these gifts, and may we reflect on those blessings back out into the world as we minister to those around us. Our worship has ended. Let our service begin. <laughs>